Good morning. Good morning. And welcome as we gather to worship. If you get cold this morning, it is my fault. I asked them to turn on the air conditioner. So last week I was hot, and I think I'm still having the effects from last night. We had our first service of the summer at uh, Eagle Valley Church. And by the time I was done there, I was drenched. So, <laughs> I, so if you get cold, um, let us know later on, and we'll try to find a happy medium between you and for what I need. Or I'll stop wearing a robe for the summer, either way. But as we gather, we gather today and we welcome you. We welcome you no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter where you may be on your spiritual journey. And that includes those of you at home who will be joining us later through the recording of the afternoon. We are glad that you still join us and are part of this congregation. I want to highlight a few of the announcements, the first being that next week, worship time is being switched to 8.30 a.m. for here at St. John's, and that will continue through the end of the year. Hope and St. John's are flipping their worship times for six months, and next week, if I am not here at 8.30, just keep playing a little bit later. It means I went to Hope first, and they're sending me back to come to you. This will continue through the end of the year, and as we get closer to the end of the year, we'll start talks about ourselves and also with hope about how these different worship times work for each congregation and what we want to do going forward. So this is still part of the let's try this out process that we're going through as we are joined with ministry, through your minister, with hope. Uh, lift up for those who are either related or are coming to our confirmation classes. This week will be confirmation on Tuesday and Thursday. It is why on the front of the bulletin you'll see that my office hours on Tuesday are now every other week. I haven't figured out how to be in the office and teaching at the same time, so that will also continue through the summer. Are there any other announcements to be lifted up this morning? Well, then I invite all who are able in body or spirit to rise and join me in our responsive call to worship. The Holy Spirit has given us life and pours on us the power to become new people. Come here in faithfulness and be ready for the surprises that God's Spirit brings. We open our lives to the presence of God, and He just has promised to us that we can live the lives of freedom and grace. May God have us to be true people of the Spirit, letting holy surprises fill our days. Our opening hymn is number 42, of 4,000 tongues to sing. <laughs>
each week as we come together, we are invited to take a moment and reflect on the past week, to reflect on where we may have fallen short, have done what we wish we hadn't done, or not done what we wish we had. But we also reflect on the past week to look at where God's presence has been evident to us, and where we have done things that we hope that we continue to do as part of our lives. So in confidence that God's grace is always with us, I invite you to join me in our prayer for transformation and new life. Restoring God, too often we accept the conditions of the world around us and impose limitations on what is possible. We bind ourselves to societal conventions, norms, and pressure, rather than follow you and your way of the Spirit. We reaffirm the values of the world, rather than pursue the fruit of the Spirit. Show us the path of life and freedom in you. Teach us to plant seeds of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we can readily bear that fruit. Hear the good news. God's love for us never fades. The grace of God is always, always pursuing us. We are already forgiven, and we are already blessed. Please join me in our response in 493. Oh Jesus, I have promised on stanza two. Gospel of Luke. 
And as I will say in the first line, Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. This is a pivot point, a hinge point in the Gospel of Luke. Before this, Jesus has been establishing his ministry, calling the disciples, doing a lot of healing and teaching. But now, as I said, he is headed towards Jerusalem and to where he knows he will likely face death and at least great opposition. And so at this point, his teaching turns more to the kingdom of God, but also to what will happen and how they are to live after he is gone. So let's listen for God's voice in these words. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and as he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <coughs> to another, Jesus said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God add a blessing of understanding to our hearing these words. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and spirits be inspired by your Holy Spirit and thus made pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <laughs> Growing up, I spent a many a sick day morning watching Let's Make a Deal, the original one with Monty Hall, not the new one with Wayne Brady, though that is still good. Monty would roam up and down the aisles yelling, let's make a deal, inviting people to give him something out of his purse for a hundred dollars, or to choose between an envelope or something under the box. Now, if you've watched either the Monty Hall or the Wayne Brady version, you know that the highlight of the show is when they ask the contestants to pick a prize from behind a curtain. There are three, and at least one hides a prize of value, such as a car or a vacation in an exotic area. Well, the other two, if you pick those, you get what they call a zonk. A booby prize, such as a farm animal, though in this area that may not be as much of a booby prize as others. Or a broken down car, or a washboard and basin. And usually if a person picks a zonk, that's the end of it. But every once in a while, especially if the prize that they have discovered is something of lesser value than one of those big ones, such as a TV, the person is given another chance. They can either keep what they have or choose what's behind another curtain. Now those offering to follow Jesus in our passage today might have wished they were given that chance to pick what was behind another curtain or feel like they had been handed a zonk by Jesus. 
And actually, I think it sounds like a different Jesus than we usually describe or know. It does start out with the Jesus that we expect. As he is traveling along, having set his face towards Jerusalem, he sends some of his disciples ahead to prepare towns to receive him. One Samaritan town refuses. And so as they walk along, John and James ask Jesus if Jesus wants them to rain down fire and destroy the city. And here, Jesus rebukes them, tells them to leave them alone, and goes on his way. But it's here that the shift happens. First, the person approaches Jesus and says he will follow Jesus wherever he goes. And Jesus' reply is kind of cryptic rather than welcoming. Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, okay, maybe not the most welcoming response, but Jesus does like to use parables. And he is an itinerant rabbi and teacher. So maybe he isn't being as dismissive as it might sound. But then he asks someone to follow him, and that person agrees. They just need to go home and bury their father. Now, we might expect a compassionate response from Jesus here, maybe even an offer to accompany him home. Instead, Jesus seemingly flippantly replies, let the dead bury their dead. And finally, a potential follower asks to say goodbye to his family. And coldly, perhaps even a little cranky, Jesus responds, no one who puts their hand to a plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, did Jesus just get up on the wrong side of the bed that day if someone was there to catch it? Or had he not yet had his first cup of coffee? For unlike the Jesus who told John and James to leave that Samaritan town alone, Jesus sounds merciless here. After all, these are reasonable requests. They aren't, let me go off and see this movie or go on vacation. It's to bury a family member, a father, and to say goodbye to their family. The most callous response of all three, I think, is let the dead bury the dead. For this has taken on new meaning for many of us who've lost loved ones during the height of the COVID pandemic, whether from COVID itself or other causes. We couldn't travel to funerals or memorial service and gather together, finding comfort with each other and celebrating the deceased life and impact, impact on us. And so even though my siblings did their best to include me when first my father and my mother died in their graveside services, my inability to travel to them or our inability to hold a service later compounded my grief and my despair. So when I hear Jesus say, let the dead bury their dead, my initial response is, how can you be so heartless? Or as Matt Skinner suggests, we might forgive these people if after encountering Jesus, they went on to another Savior. Likewise, Carolyn Lewis first wanted to criticize Jesus' response here, that he needs to let these people do these important things. Give them a chance then to catch up. But then she started to consider these encounters to where they are in Luke's gospel, where Jesus is headed, and what the good news means. And so she says, I started imagining this from Jesus' point of view. Not only from a historical perspective, that gives attention to Jesus' own situation, 
although that is worth considering. But from the perspective of the urgency of God's favor, that every minute matters for those to whom it really matters, that every moment count. For those in urgent need of the good news, one of love, one of release, one of reminder that they are one of the beloved family of God, waiting is not an option. Now the passage tells us that when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face towards Jerusalem. And I love that phrase. They didn't say he just started heading towards Jerusalem. He set his face. There was one place he was going, one purpose, and nothing was going to distract him from that which is surprising because he's likely going to face death there. But that means that there won't be time for people to catch up. And if they do follow him, they risk the same fate. And he has so much to do before he fulfills his purpose as intended. For his purpose, as he declares at the beginning of Luke, is to bring the good news and spread spread it, embody it, that the reign of God is at hand, breaking through in love and in ways that have real impact on people's lives, such as giving sight to the blind and freeing the oppressed. So for those who want to follow him, to learn from him, time is really short. If they're going to follow him, they must do like his first disciples, drop everything and do it now. So we may think then that this passage really doesn't apply to us, that we aren't following Jesus through some Galilean countryside as he heads to Jerusalem, or because Jesus doesn't provide some sort of deadline or due date for the good news to be fulfilled in his purpose. We have time to bury our dead and find a place to rest, go off to work and be distracted by who knows what. We can do all that and clear our agendas before we get down with this Christian business. But I don't think it's true. For I agree with Lewis that from God's perspective, every minute matters for those for whom the good news matters. Every moment counts. It needs to be done and needs to be shared each and every moment that we can. For it matters too much for others and for us. That's part of what makes these verses sound so hard, I think. The other part I feel is because we understand what it means to follow Jesus. That what is at the foundation of the good news and what we are called to do as a result. For the good news is grows from God's love for humanity and for individuals, and grows out of our call to love our neighbor as ourselves. As Paul says, this is the law we follow. And not just love as in, I'm so sorry for you, bless you, and then we go on our way. The type of love that Jesus calls us to live in and express is defined as agape, the Greek word. It requires us seeing each and every person as a beloved child of God and relating to them in that image despite what we may see in front of us. I've been told after many a sermon or discussion about love and unity that pastor that is wonderful and it would be great if we lived that way but that's not how the real world works and in one sense they are right that's not how the world works the love of god expressed by jesus 
the call to express that to others is counter to so many of the values and goals of the world now and through the centuries. And if we need evidence of that, we need to look no farther back than this week. This past week, the Supreme Court handed down two decisions, one on the New York gun registration law and one on the standing of Roe versus Wade. Both were met with deep and emotional reactions. Some celebrated and hailed those decisions, and some are enraged or grieved. Now, I have my own beliefs and opinions based on my understanding of my faith and how I live it out, and I would be happy to share those with anyone who wishes outside of worship. But what struck me most as people reacted to both these decisions, those who agreed did celebrate, while those who disagreed, grieved and protested. And at the government level, no matter what the response was, they were carefully crafted that while it may renounce the actions of the Supreme Court, or of those who are upset by those rulings, most steered clear of disparaging the motives, or at least the character, of those involved. Most did. However, the same cannot be said for the news media, social media, commentary, and protests either in support or against these decisions. Whether celebrating or lamenting the decisions, they seem to have finally degenerate into declaring that the other side were right deniers, heartless, women haters, killers, evil, threats to the society, and so on. There have even been death threats against individuals or those seen as being on the other side. This is especially prevalent on social platforms such as Twitter or Facebook, where the characters are limited to express yourself and you're looking at a screen and not the other person's face. And we know what will happen as the election cycle picks up. Both parties and all candidates, well maybe not all candidates, but candidates on both sides, whether they agree or disagree with these decisions, will have campaign ads that are filling our airways of how these decisions harm our way of life and that people must vote in order to defeat this godless, right-denying, country-hating, profit-mongering, evil opponents, or whatever it be that the Democrats or the Republicans are railing against. What they'll have in common is that all will be demonizing the other, reducing anyone who disagrees to a character at best and less than human at the worst. And it's easy to get caught up in those emotions and those reactions. They're human, God-given. And our culture and society seems to encourage such extreme reactions, especially today. An emphasis on winning over an opponent, talking heads that don't even pretend to listen to each other, but talk over each other as our springs are divided into four. Yet God calls us to another way, a way of belovedness that we see in Jesus. A belovedness that we recognize in each other as God recognizes in us. And so, as with most scripture, if not all, this passage is about more than one point, and through the Spirit's prompting, continues to lead us to hear how God is speaking through and using it for us today. So yes, this passage does set the scene as Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. It tells about the potential cost his disciples and earlier followers faced, and the urgency of Jesus himself as he heads towards Jerusalem and death. But Jesus' admonitions here also remind us of what it means to follow him now, to live 
about that commandment to love God and to love each other. Perhaps Jesus replies to those who say they will follow him sounds so harsh because he knows that they don't understand yet what it is really about. For he understands that the call to love is not just about being nice, but can be so countercultural and so contrary to many of the ways of the world that it will be resisted and maybe even attempted to be wiped out. For a world that overvalues economic, political, power, and authority, that views the world through a lens that there's only a scarcity of resources and rights and human compassion, so some must be the haves and some must be the have-nots, some must be lesser than. It's not going to be easy. We've witnessed how people reacted to these two Supreme Court decisions with those who agree or disagree with them. They often and did retreat quickly from expressing their emotions or their beliefs where they differ to attacking the personal morals and motives and even the very identity of the people they disagree with. And that's what makes this so hard. And why Jesus' words resonate with us even today. For behind the seeming harshness, we recognize the truth. Following Jesus is not going to be easy. The reign of God is near, but it isn't fully evident yet. So by living in the ways of God, of love, and mercy and compassion, even as we live out God's ways of justice and speaking up for the vulnerable and the oppressed, is going to be met with resistance. It might even be ridiculed as looking foolish or naive, for it doesn't change anything, or is counter to the ways that it really is. And we will fall, and we will fail, and we will forget to live this way. It's hard because of so much that it stands against. But there is something more powerful than the forces that do allow us to live a life following the Risen One. A Risen One who does today allow us to catch up, sometimes pulling us up and coming back so that we can continue to follow. It's God's determination that no one be left behind, but all be brought into the reign of God, where love is a dominating determination, where grace abounds, and everybody experiences wholeness and abundance, so that we live in joy with each other, despite or with our differences. The good news is that not only is this possible, but this is the way that God intends it to be, that God is already bringing about in ways that we can see and ways that we cannot yet imagine. So it is good news that even as we disagree, as we address real problems and issues, we too can live in recognition and celebration that those who disagree with us are still God's beloved, as are we. And when we live within that love, when we experience it as true, we are freed, as Paul says, to act with others in the way that God acts towards us, with love, compassion, and joy. And that is good news indeed. Amen. I invite you to rise as able and join me in hymn number 170, Your Ways Are Not Our Own.
worries and concerns and hold them up together in prayer. This morning, we also observe and celebrate the 60th, 60th anniversary of the United Church of Christ. And this denomination that we are part of was joined together in the 50s as a way to try to express that unity among differences in love. It came out of that drive which had joined together the Evangelical Reformed and the German Reformed churches to form one denomination. And for the Christian, and it was not like Christian denomination, there was a church denomination called just Christian. The Christian and the Congregationalists had joined together to form one denomination. And the hope was that as they joined together in the 50s, that this would just be one step of coming together and that other denominations would join with them and they would join with other denominations. That has yet to happen, though we do have covenants with many of the denominations to share things like ministers, communion. But that drive still continues not only among the denominations that we reach out to, but among our people, as we are a denomination that strives and does fail sometimes at it, but continues to strive to be able to be a place where we worship together, even when we disagree, and that we do so with love and grace. And so this morning, I will be lifting up a prayer to celebrate the denomination, but I do ask if there are any joys or concerns to be lifted up, both in silence and later by the congregation. Sue. Just for Jennifer and all her medical issues that continue to be pretty serious. Prayers for Jennifer Hansen, who had surgery a few weeks ago and has been having a rough time with complications since then and still continues. Any others? Then let us pray first in silence and then with words. Oh God, eternal spirit. You have called us into relationship to fulfill a mission whose meaning we yet dimly see. Grant to the United Church of Christ, both as a whole and as individual congregations, a secure sense of our identity as people of rich human lineage, as children of promise, and as nobodies unless you claim us as your own. Make us impatient with any identity that does not propel us into the struggle for justice, liberation, and peace, no matter how we are called to live that out. Distribute among us gifts of faith and prayer, of prophecy and discernment, of love and hope, so that we may never cease doing your will. and continue to push us to reach out, to reach out and unify with others in love even as we celebrate and keep our differences, that we as a denomination and as the churches and as members of these churches continue to provide the witness and given your will and your grace the means by which such reconciliation can happen. For we live in a world that is so much in need of that. Holy One, we lift up all these prayers, as well as the unspoken ones of our hearts and spirits, in the name of Jesus, using together the words with which he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. At the back of the sanctuary are offering plates for where you can make a gift to support the ministry of this congregation both inside and outside these walls. But you also, I think, have made some other offerings this week, whether of your time, your talent, your compassion, sometimes your presence. Some may have been recognized. Some may be made in secret, and no one but you and God know. Let us lift up all of these offerings and dedicate them to God with our offering dedication. Giver of gifts, receive the resources we bring. May they bless our community and our world. May bombs of scarcity be broken as we meet the needs around us with the gifts that you have first given to us. May we be gladdened by giving and rejoice in generosity. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 172, Jesus Calls Us Over Tumult. Please rise as able in body or spirit. so that God can use us 
and our example and our lives to change the world, to reach out to those who are hurting and in need of the message of the freedom that God's reign brings. And so as you go into the world, stand firm in the freedom of Christ, be guided and live by the Spirit, glorify God and bear fruit. And all God's people said, Amen. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Amen.